everything I learned from the Bay Boy went straight into the film that I did uh, with Mr. Spielberg. Uh, and everything that I learned from those two projects went straight into Stand By Me and so on and so on and so on. And, and when I say everything I learned, it's not necessarily because I did something that worked. A lot of the learning comes from something you do that doesn't work. And a lot of the learning comes from something you do that's maybe almost even, in, well, not almost or even, embarrassing. I'm Joe Newmeyer, film critic for New York's WOR Radio. And a while ago, in one of the many memorable films our guest today has made, he played a doctor in a very cool sci-fi noir who mixes various vivid memories to create a response. Well, our guest today has been doing the same kind of thing in movies and on TV and on stage for nearly 40 years, playing unforgettable villains, poetic young heroes, an unexpected president, and one very busy anti-terrorist expert handling danger one intense day at a time. In Showtime's The Cane Mutiny Court Martial, a terrific film of the classic play, he plays Captain Quig, the career naval officer whose command of his vessel and his faculties is questioned during a trial. We'll hear from him about that film and so much else in the next 90 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Kiefer Sutherland. Hi. It's so good to see you. See you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiefer. Thank you. Welcome, Kiefer. Thank you so much for being here. A real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you're so welcome. It's all true. And I just gave a little preview, obviously, of some of the notable work we're going to discuss. But let's start, of course, at the beginning. Always the best place to start, like they say in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, your parents, the great Donald Sutherland and esteemed Shirley Douglas, were actors. And you first performed in a play, I believe, at age 11, right, mm -hmm. in Los yeah. Angeles, right, the Odyssey Theater. Uh, was that the moment or was there another moment when you kind of got the acting bug and you thought, this is it, I want to act? No, th this, this was the beginning of a process and, and it was a process. I, I grew up with my mom in Toronto, Canada and she was a very successful theater actor um, after a while, um, and, which is something that I'll, I'll go back into. Um, but I would with my sister, I have a twin sister, and she and I would finish school, and we would go to the theater where my mom would be performing, and we'd have a snack after school, and then we'd start our homework, and then, uh, and my mom got very clever. I mean, she utilized us immensely, and uh, there were times where she would place us in the theater and, and cue people when to clap, <laughs> and cue people when to start laughing. So we knew the scripts uh, with her as well, and. And so it set a sense of community, uh, and all of, all of my mother's friends were quite eccentric, uh, certainly from all walks of life, um, uh, and, and I just knew inherently that they were more interesting than, you know, my other friends' parents and their friends. And, and, <laughs> and so I was kind of at a disadvantage because I just knew I would want to kind of live within this community. And so that, that was a very big thing for me. But the first job that we were talking about was a play called Throne of Straw. It was about the Lodes Ghetto. Uh, it was a two act uh, and I could play violin. And my mother was very good friends with a director by the name of Donald Freed who did not like children. And, <laughs> and, and this whole play was about uh, the leadership of the Lodes Ghetto, uh, making decisions about who to send off to Auschwitz in an effort to protect the children. So inherently there were children in the play. Um, the largest part uh, was given to me because he had begged my mom to kind of get her to help me learn the lines. I could play the violin so that wasn't going to be a thing uh, and that he really didn't want to have to deal with me. Um, and so so my mom presented this option to me, uh, and, and I remember I was very excited and keen to try it, uh, but I had to give up a season of hockey. Uh, and, and, and for an 11-year-old, and I, I was good, and for an 11-year-old, that was a significant kind of, uh, I had to let that go. In the meantime, my family's emigrating back to Canada, and, 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 and I'm left behind to do this play. And, 
And it was an amazing, it was just an amazing experience for me. I mean, I, I love the process of creating a character and eventually Donald Freed did have to deal with me. Um, and, and he taught me an amazing amount. Uh, but also there were young actors and actresses, uh, and by that I mean, you know, any, anything between 18 and 25. Um, and they really took me in. And like any 11-year-old, there was an 18-year-old girl that I got a crush on. <laughs> and, and, and because I was working in the play, she didn't treat me like I was 11. And I thought, well, that's a fast track to stuff. And, <laughs> and, and yeah, at 11, I was, I was already working my way. Um, and so I did the play for about three or four months, and this was, again, the most significant thing. I loved the people. I loved the sense of community. I loved the process of, of doing the play. Uh, I could absolutely get a sense of what the audience was feeling from the beginning of the play to the end of the first act to the beginning of the second act. Through, so I had an innate understanding and relationship with an audience at a very early age. Um, but at the end of the day, it was really the first and only thing that a large group of people told me I did well. I was not a great student. I was not the best hockey player. I was not a lot of things. I was not a lot of things. Um, but this I seemed to have some energy and drive towards. And then it's amazing when someone actually just says, oh, you're good at that. How amazing that makes you feel. And what that, you know, what you'll do to have that person say that to you again, or somebody else say that to you again. And so really from that point forward, it was always in the back of my mind. Music kind of took over on some level, just because my mother had made this promise that if I played the violin till I was 10, she would get me a guitar. And, and to her credit, she kept her word, and she got me a guitar. And other than playing in that play, uh, I never touched the violin again. <laughs> it's one of many deep regrets I have as an older person. Um, uh, so that took up a lot of time. And it wasn't until later, I was so fortunate when I, when I look back on, on stuff. When I was 14 or 13 years old, John Travolta in his late 20s was playing a teenager in Greece. And that's how all films had been done. And then all of a sudden, Timothy Hutton plays an 18-year-old at 18 in Ordinary People and delivers one of the most moving performances uh, that certainly I had ever seen to that point in my life. Wins the Academy Award, then Sean Penn does Fast Times at Ridgemount High. They do taps together. And all of a sudden I find myself now 14, 15, and teenagers are playing teenagers, and that's that's a monumental shift in the way films are being made. And so I was so lucky to be 15 at that time and have already worked because I had done a couple more plays in Canada. And so that was really the beginning of it. Um, and it's so funny when you think of the difference between someone 11 and, and 14. It's, it's three years. Now I blink and three years are gone. <laughs> and... and, and uh, but those three years were just felt forever for me. Yeah. Um, but I was just so fortunate at, at, a, at the right time to be the right age uh, and have literally just some experience, yeah. which was more than anybody else. And, uh, and yeah, so, and then it started. Yeah, it did start. And, and once you set out professionally to be an actor, uh, after a few small uh, brief appearances in films, including Max Dugan Returns. You starred in a wonderful 1984 Canadian film. Well, called I'll tell you something uh, yeah. about that really quickly. Sure. So my mom and dad, like so many parents, had kind of crafted these fantastic, poorly negotiated deals where every other year the poor children get sent somewhere else for Christmas. <laughs> it does, uh, doesn't matter what's going on with that other parent, you're going. I spent one Christmas in Stewart, British Columbia, which is about 60 miles south of the Arctic, because that's where my dad was working and he was taking us, God damn it. <laughs> and um, this is one of those moments where it worked out for me. I was 14 years old and I was visiting for Christmas and he was doing a film uh, with Marsha Mason called Max Dugan Returns. And he knew that I was working in Canada <clears throat> in a play and he said, well, I'm going to go work today. Why don't you come down and work as an extra? And I said, well, I don't want to be rude, but... 
<laughs> doesn't sound like much fun to me. <laughs> and he said, oh, come on, you'll, you'll have fun. And, and, and that film had Matthew Broderick in it, Marsha Mason, um, my dad, uh, and, and Jason Robarts. And Jason Robarts. Uh, the day wasn't that much fun. I got to meet Matthew Broderick, who was absolutely lovely, and, uh, and, and War Games was just about ready to come out. Um, but I did the day's work, and this was back in the day when if you were just doing day kind of work, you got paid that day. And I got a check for like close to two and a half thousand dollars, which was more than I was making the entire play that I was doing up in Canada. I'm like, I definitely see myself coming to Hollywood at some point. This is, this is, this is going to work out. So, so it was... It, People say, you know, that, that I did that film. I did not do that film. I, I mean, I, I walked across and waved at someone in the parking lot, but they paid me $2,500 to do it. And, <laughs> and, and it got me to New York, yeah. right? So yeah. it was just amazing, uh, kind of where you pick up kind of those little pieces of information that, <laughs> that gets you from A to B. Right, yeah. right. I love that. So no more Canadian plays, but there was this great Canadian film called The Bay Boy. Mm -hmm. It's written and directed by Daniel Petrie, co-starring Lee Volman. Uh, you play, have such a naturalistic performance in there. It's a starring role. You play a, an altar boy who's kind of being awakened to the world a little bit in 1937. I'm wondering if there were lessons you learned on that film, Kiefer, that sort of resonated with you, you know, throughout the years, even to, to maybe recently. Huge. Uh, Daniel Petrie uh, was telling his autobiographical story. Uh, he had witnessed a murder during the Depression in, in Glace Bay in Nova Scotia, where he grew up. And it was incredibly personal to him. Um, he'd made such great films as Fort Apache, The Bronx, Raisin in the Sun, The Dollmaker. Uh, and, and he was a real success story in Canada. And the process, the audition process, was almost a year. And that was a whole education in itself, yeah. right? And just kind of how to not scare anybody in the audition room. And I learned that very quickly because you'd see someone who just went in with all the energy in the world and then... <laughs> And you could just tell by the way the people came out to ask for the next person that that person didn't get the job. <laughs> right, right. But he must have done something extraordinary in that room. And so you kind of got to pull back. And, and I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Dan Petrie was a very kind of patriarchal guy. Uh, and, and I could feel him kind of slightly starting to take me under his wing, mm -hmm. even through that process. So that gave me confidence. Mm. Um, which is everything. Yeah. Uh, someone can make you and break you by just kind of how they handle your confidence. Yeah. Um, and I just got very lucky. And it was a beautifully written script. L Lee Volman was extraordinary to work with. Alan Scarf, Peter Donat, right, yeah. uh, extraordinary actors uh, had come out to do the piece. But again, it was all just so new. I remember unpacking at the Holiday Inn in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. And I remember putting everything in my stuff where it was going to be and it was like yeah i'm paying for this room my parents aren't paying for this room i'm paying for this room i'm working i'm like this is the day my life began mm -hmm. and then i get in a van with all the other cast and director and and john kemeny our producer and we go to the only restaurant large enough has a table large enough to seat us all uh, it's a chinese restaurant on the north end of town and we're sitting there, and it's fantastic. This is all I've dreamed of. We're having these great conversations about what the film's going to be like and what we're going to do and what are we shooting first. And, and everybody's so committed and, and, uh, and, and excited. And we finish the meal, and everybody's given a fortune cookie. <laughs> and I open mine, and it says, go home. <laughs> I'm not joking, that has sat with me Ow. for 40 years. For 40 years I have questioned whether or not I should have followed the cookie. I should have gone into politics like my grandfather. And, uh, but of course, you know, yeah, I, I stayed. Um, but, but, but in all fairness, I, my experience was in theater and Daniel Petrie really took the time mm -hmm. to teach me about camera. And so what he had done is he got me a 35 millimeter camera and he got me a zoom lens that went from 70 to 25. And I would walk around and I would just get used to going from a 50 millimeter to a 70 millimeter, back to a 35 millimeter, back to a 28 millimeter. Ooh, can't back up far enough for that. 
And, and I started to get a sense of the lenses. Mm -hmm. And then he just said, just imagine, you know, you're doing your play in that frame. Yeah. And so act accordingly. And it was a huge lesson. I know it sounds really simplistic, um, but actually having the physicality of a camera and a zoom lens that was allow me to kind of constantly readjust and understand what those lenses were going to mean to me because they were the canvas that you get to paint on. Um, and, and that was hugely instrumental. Um, and again, he never yelled, mm -hmm. he, you know, and, he, and this was not a big budget film. He never yelled, he never got off his bike. Um, and I was learning. You know, I mean, the, the, that was the beginning of the search of the 10,000 hours, right? Yeah, right? And so the fact that I had, I was in the right place at the right time, young people were being asked to do films, I got an incredibly nurturing man mm -hmm. with deep, deep skill uh, who decided to take me under his wing and kind of shepherd me through this process and, and start the education of, of, of how to actually work as an actor in film. It, it was monumental. And again, by the time we're finished, you guys are going to go, he's the luckiest son of a bitch I've ever met <laughs> because you're going to see so many different things played a part that I, I had no control over. Uh, and I was just incredibly fortunate. The, the people that I ran into along the way. Yeah, yeah well, I'm sure I speak for everyone. I say I'm very glad you did not follow the cookie, Kiefer. The, uh, <laughs> in 1986, came Stand by Me, uh, your first film in the yes, uh, first film in the U.S. Talk to us about Ace Merrill, uh, the character that really made people say, "Who is that guy? Who is he? I want to know more about him." What was the audition like for director Rob Reiner, and what do you want to bring to the performance? Well, I'll give this to Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner is still the only director that's ever hired me in the room, oh. um, and that just makes you feel amazing. Um, but I, I have a feeling I cheated a little on that. The first director to hire me in the United States was Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. for an hour episode of his amazing story show that he directed. Yep. And the fantastic thing about the lack of imagination in Hollywood, if you can get it to work for you, is quite extraordinary. <laughs> Steven Spielberg hired me. I had a golden pass for a year till it came out, right? And so I scooped up as many jobs as I could. And, and Stand By Me was one of those. Um, uh, it, to get hired in the room was an amazing thing. It made you feel very confident about what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, it was also the first time I was working for an, an act, who, someone I considered to be an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just it was it was just so archetypal. It, it was it was so clear that this guy was without redemption, and these children were with redemption, and and, and it was a very kind of fifties esque type yeah. story. And and so the lines were bold. It, it, it the only the only thing that was kind of outside of the box that I remember at all was that I had said in the chase sequence, you know, when we're when we're playing chicken on the highway, can I have a toothpick? And then I would just, as I would look calm as can be, but you would see my heart race because the toothpick would start to move faster. Yeah. And, then, and then as soon as the threat was averted, toothpick stopped. And so I was kind of toying with ideas of how to do that. And he, he liked that idea. And, and again, just an incredibly nurturing guy. And a thing about Rob Reiner, which was so cool that no one talks about was Stand By Me. We're at a time when I think kids could shoot eight hours a day maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, and out of that eight hours, he took four hours with every one of them and they played theater games. They didn't roll a single lick of film. They had to learn all each other's dialogue, which I thought was genius. Yeah. And then they all had to throw the dialogue back at each other. So one kid would hear someone else do it and go, well, that was pretty good. I'm going to take that little piece from there. And then they'd play games with like tennis balls and he'd throw a tennis ball and that kid had to throw out a line and, and out of order and everything else. So by the time they went to go shoot any of these sequences, they were so familiar with not only their own dialogue, but themselves and the other kids. And, and it didn't change the fact that they were 12, 13 year old kids and they were competitive and this was going on. And, uh, but he managed to really take the time to get them to work. When you sacrifice, when you are a director and you have the courage to sacrifice half of your daily shooting schedule yeah. to do that, yeah. you know, I think you know what you're doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, you mentioned uh, the mission, which is the episode of Amazing Stories. We have a question later on that I'm going to talk to you about directors, but let's speak about it right now because that's a terrific episode. Kevin Costner is in it, uh, Casey Chamasco. Uh, it's a really terrific ensemble, and you're all in essentially one set, a, uh -huh. a bomber during World War II. What was it like being directed by Spielberg? What did you learn on that, on that particular shoot? I was amazed to see him walk. Right, I thought he'd float in, because like, <laughs> um, he he was he was he had such status, uh, and and still does. Uh, but I was kind of taken away at first, because I was a little cynical. At first, I I thought, well, he he has this childlike kind of energy about working, and I thought, well, he's kind of laying that on a bit thick, and then. It just never left, and I realized that's actually who he is. Mm -hmm. And and he loved making movies, and he loved just he loved the minutia of it. He loved the scale of it, mm -hmm. uh, every every aspect in between. Uh, he really loved actors, um, and 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 he makes you feel that if he hired you, he hired you for the reason. Mm -hmm. And so you're not chasing him down trying to figure out mm -hmm. what it is he wants. He basically he hired you, and and you know it, and he makes you feel that. So, so it was it was it was an amazing thing. Casey Shamashko and I did Stand by Me together. Then we went on and did Young Guns together. Mm -hmm. So we were good friends. Um, and yeah, it was it was exciting. I mean, it was the beginning of anything is always going to be the yeah. thing that you look back on and just go, God, I can't believe how lucky I was. And yeah. and, uh, and so all of it was exciting. Couldn't get over the fact that I'm working with a guy in the big chill, and you know, and right. yeah. his feet. Right, that's right. Cut Kevin Costner, right. for yeah. all of you who don't know, oh. uh, was the dead guy in the beginning of The Big Chill, and since <laughs> they didn't go back to any of the flashbacks, he was cut out of the rest of the film. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and I love The Big Chill so much, I thought, well, cool, you still got your feet in. You know, <laughs> he did not see it the same way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and, and he was really, he was like having a great older yeah. brother. Right, yeah. 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 So. Well, and you continued a one-two punch from the dark side of youth in 1987 with the Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, your fang, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Your fanged flying character of David is a vampire who makes the undead look pretty awesome. Uh, he's the first character we see in the film. As he, you know, you're striding in your long coat on the carousel in this California beach town uh, with the cigarette behind your ear. Um, that film and that character is very much a Gen X landmark in a lot of ways. Uh, must have been fun in your career to kind of really kind of give it your all, kind of snarl a lot like that. What was your approach to, to David, Kiefer? Again, it was, it, it was pretty straight up. Uh, the script was written for 13-year-olds. It wasn't written for the film that Joel Schumacher ended up making. And he, he was very clear about that. And that he that we'd be getting pages on certain days and that he really wanted to kind of, he, he wanted it made more mature. And, um, but the lines were still the same. The goalposts were all still the same. And, you know, uh, I think Jason Patrick and I were kind of competitive with each other, but we were also very, very good friends. Um, I also thought that with the kind of, with never being Fear, fearing death. Mm -hmm. If if that albatross was taken off one's back, what would you actually be like? And I actually took the question seriously, and I, and so I thought that the boundaries of sexuality were gone, the boundaries of fear were gone, the boundaries of of anything you know that that kind of normal human beings deal with is has been removed, and so there were parts of of that movie on purpose for me, whether they resonate or not, where it was very questionable whether or not my character actually was in love with Jason's character and kind of wanted him uh, in, in that kind of way. And that was not something that Joel advocated for. It was just a thought of mine that, that all of those boundaries would be done. And so, so that, was, that was kind of a, a, a big theme for me. Um, but I was also very young when we were doing it, and, and I was very aware that I had this theory that as long as you got another job before the last one came out, you know, you'd still have another chance. <laughs> Such a positive way to live. Um, uh, I couldn't help but be taken by Joel Schumacher as a director. 
Alex Winter, uh, Jason Patrick, Billy Worth, uh, Brooke, we were all friendly. But this felt like a big movie. Yeah. And then uh, Dick Donner as a producer is a larger than life character. Uh, and Lethal Weapon had come out uh, maybe six months before Lost Boys. And Dick Donner had produced that too. And so on the marquee of, on Sunset with Mel Gibson running with his shirt off, escaping from the bad guys. A huge close-up is Lost Boys on the, on the cover of the billboard. And I'm like, this is gonna be huge. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and you could feel it. It was just, it was, it was a big studio production. It was kind of, uh, um, Stand By Me was not. Stand By Me was a, a, a small movie. Uh, it, was, it was released by Columbia, but Norman, gave Norman Lear gave eight million dollars to Rob Reiner to make the film and then at the last minute panicked and sold the film for eight million dollars to Columbia a film made over 110 million dollars in one summer and um, uh, and Norman Lear never broke a smile so you know it, it, it's it, it it speaks volumes to his character uh, but yeah so Warner Brothers doing Lost Boys that was that was a that felt like a big movie it looked like a big movie, uh, and by that I don't mean the film itself, but like our base camp. Mm -hmm. You're like, it's, this is a circus. We have joined the circus and we've come to town, and it felt great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I love that. We're gonna segue out of, out of villains, we're gonna come back to them later on, but I wanna mention several films from the late 80s and early 90s that featured you in a more heroic vein, and, and they're all terrific, I really love them all. There's the gritty small town drama Promise Land, mm -hmm. the sweet period film 1969, your portrayal of a young doctor at a veteran's hospital in Article 99, and in genre movies, the, you're the literate gunslinger Doc in Young Guns, and the swashbuckling Athos in, uh, in The Three Musketeers. Mm. Uh, they showcased goodness and a sly gallantry, we're going to get to more recent heroes, but talk to us about that batch of, of heroes. Maybe we'll call them the Sutherland Heroes 1.0. Well, they're very, they're very different. I mean, Article 99 was a film with Ray Liotta, um, Forrest Whitaker, John McGinley, myself. Um, Howie Deutsch directed it. Leah Thompson was in it. Um, and, and, and it was dealing with the real struggle of veterans' hospitals across America and the fact that they're deeply underfunded, that they do not promise and provide intentionally, they, they have no possible hope of providing adequate health care for these people that, that we have promised to honor and serve. Um, and so it was a story that needed to be told. I think critically it got hurt a bit because it, it, it fluctuated between kind of a MASH style comedy and, and then a very dramatic drama. Uh, and and People didn't know how to label the film, I guess. And, and, uh, but I was very, very happy with the yeah. film. It was, it was a great cast of actors. Um, so that, that was, you know, that was a young character kind of who was the doctor who came to kind of make money, who ends up becoming a better person than that and, and actually trying to help. Mm -hmm. um, young Guns was just a blast. Uh, if, if I'm ever signing something and someone comes with a Young Guns, picture or poster, I will let them know that that was the most fun I've ever had making a movie. Um, we were about 22, 23 years old. They would give us guns and horses <laughs> and told us to shoot during the daytime in the winter in New Mexico, which was maybe eight hours tops. We had a blast. Uh, I also remind them that I think Young Guns 2 is a much better movie, but we did not have as much fun. Mm. So the work does matter. Yeah. Um, but the character was wonderful. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was the guy who just doesn't want to be there. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that never gets old, especially with the other group of actors that were there. So it was, it was a lot of fun to play. Um, uh, I'm thinking, of, oh, <clears throat> Promised Land was amazing. Uh, Promised Land was a big learning experience for me. Meg Ryan was extraordinary in that movie. Uh, and we were asked to actually do the road trip that we do in the movie. So we got in a car and, and we actually drove from Reno mm -hmm. to Utah, uh, the exact route that we were taking, so that when we would go back and film it, we knew exactly where we were. And, and, and Meg was doing something that I thought was kind of peculiar, but she was clocking miles and time and she had a little diary and she was writing everything down and in the middle of the movie or three quarters of the way through the movie she has a complete mental breakdown 
and, and just literally goes completely insane and changes the course of the film and ultimately gets my character killed. Yeah. And, and I was kind of watching it out of the corner of my eye and I love her to death. I, she's immediately my best friend and, and we have a fantastic time making the film. But I know that she's worried about the scene and I don't blame her because there's not much written for it. It's like one of those kind of fantastic moments where it's a quarter of a page and it says Atlanta burns, right? This is yeah. like, character completely comes undone, da, 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 dot, dot, dot. It's yeah. like yeah. fill in yeah. the blanks. Right. And, and so I knew she was nervous about it. And when we went to shoot that sequence in the desert, in the snow, in the wind, in the cold, her performance was so dynamic mm -hmm. and just blow you away if you ever get a chance to see that movie. Her, her work in it is extraordinary. And she finished, and I didn't want to interrupt her, waited till we came around on the other side, but when we were finished for the day, I was like, what the fuck did you just do? <laughs> it was a real teaching moment to me because I hadn't seen anybody, I, I, I've, I've written character books about what the character was like before the film starts, uh, what the character might be like after the film ends. Um, but I'd never set up a device to get me to an emotional place. Mm -hmm. I'd never realized that that was even possible. And, and so it was a big moment for me in that movie uh, with her and, and uh, yeah, so yeah. that was a really important yeah. kind of learning thing for me. We're gonna go back to that uh, a little bit, the, the character books that you make that actually uh, pertains to a question that we have from the audience. But I wanna ask you about, in terms of Promised Land, also the other issue is that, or the other, the other thing that stands out for me, and that is a very dramatic scene at the convenience store uh, when your character dies. Up until that point you had, you know, been in period films taking place in the 50s or 1937, uh, or you're probably like a vampire or 1969. This was sort of one of the first ones where you're actually a young man in his time in Reagan's America, yeah. uh, and kind of portraying <clears throat> a, a certain kind of emotional ennui that's going on and a, and a listlessness and a, and a sense of, um, of trying to find their way. What was that like as a young actor at that moment? Because that kind of thing can be, I would imagine, a little bit of a, a kind of formidable to kind of tackle and yet it's also, you do it so beautifully, kind of portraying that moment. Well, it was, it was the first time I'd been given the opportunity, really since the Bay Boy, mm -hmm. to be that vulnerable mm. as a character. Yeah. Uh, and Meg was so fantastic about being demonstrative and taking the reins in this duo mm -hmm. that, I, you know, I, I can walk down the street and I can carry myself pretty well and I can handle myself too. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not scared all the time. Yeah. And I mean in everyday life, I'm, I'm scared all the time. And I really know what that feels like. And I don't like it. And I don't like people that make me feel that way. And so to be able to put all of that into a character like this and feel that vulnerable and being able to kind of show it and let it out, it's really quite cathartic. And I, and I don't think that, that acting is therapy. But there are just moments in life where... You, where yeah things cross paths and, and it is just a kind of a, a nice release and, a, and just to be able to kind of show that part of yourself and to have a job that allows you to do that. And so that film was fantastic for that reason too. And there were very quiet moments um, that, that were kind of set up to allow that to happen and yeah. I thought very tastefully done. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of these films that we've mentioned, uh, as well as Flatliners, a reunion with Joel Schumacher in 1990, are ensembles. Talk to us, Kiefer, about the dynamic that works with a group of actors, and, and in these cases, many were your peers, they were close to the same age, or placed in their careers, or, or in the case of like Robert Downey Jr., uh, a former roommate, Julia Roberts, Meg Ryan, as we mentioned, Charlie Sheen, Oliver Platt. What did you learn from acting alongside your peers or friends at this time of your life and, and at that moment in your career? Well, it's, it's always funny at the beginning, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky that, that all of the actors that I've worked with, older, younger, uh, same age, that at the end of the day when the kind of beginning is over, mm -hmm. the introductions have been made, uh, everybody just smartens up and goes to work, right? And, and <laughs> I've been responsible for some stupid stuff. Uh, some others have been responsible for some stupid stuff. I remember Julia Roberts when we when we were doing uh, when we were doing Flatliners. She came in late. She she was like a few days late to rehearsals because of something else she was doing. And Kevin Bacon and I, uh, I, I admired Kevin uh, um, Footloose 
believe it or not, I, I thought he was so cool in that film and, uh, yeah. when it came out. And I thought, well, that's, that's how you do that. And uh, so I, I really respected him. Uh, I thought his work in Diner as a contrast was so fantastic. And so I was really thrilled to meet him. Uh, Oliver Platt made me laugh. Uh, Billy Baldwin was just really sweet. Uh, and we'd gone out a few nights. We're in Chicago. We're, we're all in our early 20s. And, and Julia shows up. And we, we'd been out quite late the night before, and we're all having breakfast. And Julia had been invited. And, and uh, I was telling a story, I think, to Kevin about something that had happened that night before. And, and they all start to laugh. And she said, you guys think that's funny? And I looked at her and said, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> And I don't know why I said it. I, I, I clearly was. But it was this kind of competitive thing. Everyone was kind of feeling each other out. And so the next day, she says, uh, you want to go grab a drink? And I said, well, I'm, I'm in my hotel room. And we'd finished rehearsal. I said, I'm watching Magnum. And she took a long beat and said, can't figure that out? I was like, yeah, I'll be down in five minutes. <laughs> and, and so that was kind of chippy to say the least and and someone I later fell in love with and and one of the most extraordinary actors I've ever worked with I mean she did she did a sequence uh in Flatliners that I I wasn't in I it was just I had rap for the day and I came in to watch and and she did the sequence with her father mm -hmm. uh her father who had killed himself but in the context of our film has come back after she has flatlined and they're doing this scene together in the in the bathroom and it was an incredibly scary moment when she turns and sees him. And her reaction scared you. Yeah. But I'd never seen anybody turn. And she went from absolute fear and fright to this person being in the bathroom, seeing and recognizing that it was her father. And it was like her face slid off somewhere else. And I'm watching this on the monitor. And I look at Joel. Schumacher, and he just went, what the fuck? <laughs> and I was like, that's, uh, to that point, that was the best actor I had ever worked with. And I'd never seen anything like it. And, and she has facilities like you can't believe, you know. It's almost comical, like, you know, do you want two tears or three? <laughs> and you're like, really? You can do that? <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's scary, but, <laughs> but yeah, she, she was extraordinary. So it was, you know, so all of the kind of clucking around that one does in the kind of introduction of, of other actors, if you're serious, you get down to it. And, and I've been so fortunate to work with people that are just so good, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, and Bobby Downey. I yeah. mean, uh, I... <laughs> I was hired to build a deck for Bobby. I, I can't put two pieces of wood together to save my life. <laughs> I've been lying about building a doghouse for like 40 years. <laughs> um, but anyways, they hired me, and, and, uh, and so I got some friends to build a doghouse. I got this Tom Sawyer thing going down pretty good. <laughs> um, but we became, we became really good friends, and so does, he was with Sarah Jessica Parker at the time. Yeah. Um, and they were absolutely lovely. And, but Bobby had gone off to New York to do Saturday Night Live, and Sarah was working endlessly, and I was doing kind of these mm -hmm. films that you yeah. described. Uh, but it was so exciting that we were all working. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, these are the people that, are, you know, that you can come back to because mm -hmm. they're not working on jobs that you're doing, and you can compare notes like, mm -hmm. is it going well? Are you enjoying this? Mm -hmm. uh, what worked in this film and didn't work in the other? And so... Yeah, it was just, it was a magical time. Uh, I was living that kind of wonderful moment where your dreams come true, right? And so it's, it's so exciting. And yet you're so young that you have no perspective. Like you, you make these terrible mistakes of just thinking it's going to be like this forever. Because it's really all you know. And so I had this stretch of kind of 10 or 11 number one films. And then, boom, it just stopped. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> and, and then you kind of got to work your way from the ground up. And, and, uh, and, and I had some help with that, too. But the easiest part for me was kind of when I got old enough out of that one tricky decade that was really tough. 
uh, and realize, oh, okay, so it's just going to go in peaks and valleys, mm. right? And, and you can just, if you can learn to live with that, yeah. you're going to be all right. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's not like you have the thought and then it's just done. Yeah. It's a process, but yeah. 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 Well, one of those number one films, one of those peaks is A Few Good Men. Uh, you are a crucial part of it. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank a you. crucial part there of another classic ensemble. You play a Marine whose cruel action set up the murder uh, that gets the story going in the, the film of Aaron Sorkin's play. It was the second time for you working uh, with Rob Reiner after Stand By Me. And your character, uh, Kendrick, has a strict code. He only follows the Marine Code of Conduct and the Bible. And I'm wondering... Keep and they you... don't conflict. And they, Right. <laughs> When you play a character who has got you know parameters like that, edges like that, does it kind of give you a good toolbox to to play with, or do you kind of find like the corners that you can can work with within that? Well, if you have a character that's so dumb to limit themselves by something right. they actually yeah. say, yeah. it's kind of fantastic because yeah. it sets the parameters for you, yeah. uh, and and you you know your job yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So if you liken a cast mm -hmm. uh, to a band, mm -hmm. you know. There's some movies where you're the lead guitar player. There's some movies where you're the singer. And there's some movies where you're the bass player. And it can't get made without the bass player. And you have to kind of understand that your character is part of telling an overall story. And that's something I understood out of the gate. Yeah. So when I made choices to do films like Eye for an Eye or, or uh, A Time to Kill, where I, in order to make the film work, someone had to really play the bad, bad, bad guy, um, I did it. Um, I, I never expected people to kind of conflate you as a person with that character, yeah. which, which is hard. Um, and, and it's also hard to do. Yeah. But when you get a character uh, like, oh my gosh. A doob in an eye for an eye? or No, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking, trying to get back to the film with Tom Cruise and Jack Nichols. To Kendrick, yeah. 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 Kendrick, yeah. What's the name of that movie? A Few Good Men. There you go. <laughs> I knew it. I was just <laughs> testing you. Um, you know, you just you set up the parameters. Uh, I, again, that was such a learning experience. Um, when I was younger, when I was at theater school, I remember thinking that, you know, because Jack Nicholson was such a big star. And then if you take a look at Five Easy Pieces and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it's like, oh, well, how hard is it to be Jack Nicholson if you're going to just be Jack Nicholson? Fucking teenagers are dumb. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there on, on, first of all, he's so nice to me and, and, and so much fun. He and I went to a play the, after the first day we went working together and he took me to a play in, in Beverly Hills of all places. I didn't even know they had a theater. <laughs> and, um, and he was just so amazing to work with. And then I saw the character that he was developing and I was like, oh my God. Like, on two levels. A, I didn't know how much work went into being Jack Nicholson. And, and two, I didn't realize how amazingly different all of these characters are. Um, and he's not doing it by dyeing his hair. And he's not doing it with some crazy costume. He's doing it with character. Yeah. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah. And then the thing that I loved on that movie, and, and, and I learned two lessons here. Um, I had asked him how he... You know, everybody's got a different process in how they learn dialogue. Mm -hmm. And he would make cassettes uh, of, he would just read the whole play out. Uh, and he would just, you know, if you live in Los Angeles, you're going to drive for six hours a day. Yeah. Yeah, right. And so he would just put the cassette in his car and he would just do the dialogue back and forth with the cassette while he's stuck in traffic. <laughs> so the reason why people think he's crazy is because he's, talking to himself in his car, <laughs> but he's actually learning his dialogue. The day he did the you can't handle the truth speech, he and Tom were working, and Kevin. Everybody else came in, and spouses, to see this scene. And he did it. They did it. He and Tom both. Did, obviously did it in one pass, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole scene, it's not broken up into pieces. It's from one end to the other. And Jack gives a performance that's just, you just go, wow, he, yeah. God, he nailed it. Yeah. And Rob Reiner and everybody was respectfully, incredibly quiet. And you could hear yeah. Rob walked up to him and said, oh, that was amazing. 
do you want to do it again? <laughs> he said, well, we're here. <laughs> so <laughs> they did it again. And it, it was just as amazing and just a little different. Yeah. And Rob Reiner just went, well, I, I don't know what to do now. We <laughs> scheduled two days to do this, but we're, we're done. And <laughs> everybody got the afternoon yeah. off. And it was, yeah, it was amazing. Right. And, and so that taught me a real lesson about being prepared. Mm -hmm. And then the unsung hero in that scene is Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. Because he can't, Jack Nicholson can't dance without a partner right. in that scene. Mm -hmm. And his, the success of his performance mm -hmm. can only be achieved if his dance partner is playing on an equal level. That's right. You know? yeah. And so there's the bass player. That's right. and, and I was like, it's cool to be the bass player. Yeah. 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 And Tom did it and, and just never said a word about it. Yeah. Um, but I think Tom Cruise is extraordinary in that film as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They both are. You all are. Uh, you mentioned a couple of other villains. I'm going to ask one last villain question, but it's an important one because uh, you did so many villains around that time. You opposite Reese Witherspoon in the cult favorite Freeway in Taking Lives with Angelina Jolie and, and Ethan Hawke. You mentioned Eye for an Eye with Sally Field. Mm -hmm. um, you are memorable in all of them, Kiefer. In these roles, you remind me sometimes almost of... Um, you know, classic actors like Robert Mitchum or Richard Widmark or especially Lee Marvin. Like, I could mm -hmm. see you absolutely doing Liberty Valance mm -hmm. uh, in a heartbeat. What are some of the nuances in the art of playing a bad guy? Commitment. It's, it's, it's not even a nuance. It's, it's just mm -hmm. you have to be wholly committed. And I'll take Eye for an Eye. Eye for an Eye was not even, not even arguably, it was the hardest movie I've ever had to make. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, I played a character that raped and killed three women. Uh, the last one was Sally Field's daughter, which is what starts the film going. Uh, these scenes were incredibly hard to shoot. Um, they required time and patience beyond any other stunt that I've ever done. Uh, you literally, and, and the two older women, it was, it was a little easier because they were in fact older. The woman playing Sally Field's daughter uh, the stunt girl for that. Uh, she was in fact 22, uh, but she looked very young and she was very, very small. And, and, and I said, look, in the blocking of the scene, my hand's gonna go here, my other hand's gonna go here, I'm gonna lift you up, I'm gonna put you through the table, then I'm gonna pick up the ice sculpture, then I'm gonna come down on you with that, then I'm gonna roll you over, then I'm gonna rip your shirt, I'm gonna do all of these things, and we go one by one, and we just go over them methodically. This is this, this is this, then you're going to try and hit me here. And, and, and you block it out. And, and I, I looked at the young lady and I said, look, I know that we've got this. And it's not, it's not going to go any faster. It's going to, but it's, I'm going to come at you like a freight train. And you've got to know this. And you've got to be able to say, because you're going to say stop and a bunch of other things. So you have to be able to say something and, and stop if you need me to stop. And we do the scene and they call cut and she immediately breaks down and starts crying. And I pick her up and I carry, I still can't talk about it. And I carry her off the stage and uh, that was the one moment where I thought this isn't worth that, mm -hmm. right? This isn't worth that. And, uh, and I've never done a film like it since. Yeah. Having said that, it would have been impossible to do the story properly w without servicing how awful this person was and, and what a failure the criminal justice system was in Los Angeles at that time. And that's exactly what the story was about. In all fairness, it was really hard uh, to do that film. Um, and. Uh, Another kind of side benefit, that film came out and about 10 days later I was taking my daughter who was 10 at the time to Chuck E. Cheese mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if they have that out here in New York, but in, oh they do, okay. Well it was packed and I walked in with my daughter and within like four minutes the place was empty. Mothers were grabbing their children <laughs> and running out the door and my daughter literally thought I rented it out for us. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
where you are also a heavy in a film you directed, but I want to talk now about the direction of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was the first feature you directed following a, a TV movie called Last Light, which you also co-starred in. Uh, but in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, you're a trigger-happy thief involved in a, in a heist gone bad. But I want to ask you if you saw any differences, Kiefer, in your own acting after directing. Well, not, not so much in, in the acting, but there was a lot of phone calls that needed to be made. Mm. Um, there were phone calls to Joel Schumacher and Rob Reiner. And, you know, for all of those times that I might have been fucking around, I want to apologize because I didn't realize how valuable your time was. Mm. Uh, it taught me a huge lesson uh, about filmmaking mm. and that it wasn't just about you getting your work done that day. Uh, it was getting everybody's work done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was about 27 when I directed that film. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a big shift kind of yeah. for me, yeah. uh, just as a person in, in kind of understanding and taking responsibility for mm -hmm. what I was doing. Yeah. And, and, and that, that encompasses behavior everything. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, that this is a really special thing and an opportunity that you have and, and it has to be respected. And, and so it taught me more about that than, than the acting part. Uh, the editing, on the other hand, taught me a lot mm -hmm. about yeah. the acting part, which is, and I had no problem with cutting myself out. <laughs> uh, you know, I, and I, I think there's some actors that are directors that do have an issue with cutting themselves out. Uh, and that's gotta be tough. I have no problem with it at all. Uh, I think I was in half of that movie and I was in a third of it by the time I was finished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the film you directed after that, Woman Wanted, is also terrific and you're in that as Thank well you. with Holly Hunter and, and Michael Moriarty. That's, that almost reminds me of like a William Inge play from the 50s. It's adapted from a 1985 novel uh, by Joanna Glass. And your performance there, it's, it's kind of, it has this homebound coziness, and even though your character is troubled, he has a good nature. What drew you to a story like that? Maybe it was everything that... Uh, I, it was one of the most beautiful scripts I'd ever read. Mm. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a film about a father and a son, and, and the father, in an effort to kind of bring the son towards him, they hire uh, someone to kind of take care of the home. And of course, the father and the young son both fall in love with her, and they use her as a way to kind of challenge each other. And, and the woman was played by Holly Hunter, Michael Moriarty played the father. Um, this is why I stopped directing. I, I, I had agreed to make a movie for $5 million, and, uh, and then it, the producers said, well, we've only got four, and I agreed to do that, and I w w won't take any money. And then by the time I got to Winnipeg where we shot it, it was three, and by the time I got to the set, it was 2.5. It was just like, you can't make a movie like that. And, and, uh, and, and it was angering. Uh, and then there was a Canadian producer on the film as well uh, that there was a number criteria for the money that they got in Canada, so X amount of Canadians had to do X amount of jobs. Uh, and he knowingly knew that it didn't meet that criteria, so he re-edited the movie. So I ended up having to take my name off of it because it wasn't a reflection of what I wanted to do, and it wasn't a reflection of what I had done. Um, so it ended up being kind of what I thought was this kind of fantastic creative moment, uh, and, and these actors were extraordinary uh, to work with. But this is when kind of the commerce aspect of our business kind of I ran headlong into that and and uh, and just thought that's just not worth it yeah. right you know if if that's uh, I couldn't handle that kind of pain and, and and it actually it helped me in a way because it refocused me as an actor uh, I learned a great deal uh, about how as an actor to make certain things work technically yeah, yeah. through through directing those films but it refocused me in this is how I tell stories and this is what I want to do and there is no circumstance that's going to make me go this isn't worth it yeah. with this yeah. whereas for me as a director that circumstance was enough to make me go yeah. 
it's not worth it. Yeah, yeah. Well, right around this time, you also did Dark City, which is one of the striking movies of the 1990s. It's a movie that Roger Ebert, yeah. Roger Ebert named that the best film of 1998. Uh, I mentioned it in the intro. It's a very different kind of character for mm. you. You play Dr. Schreiber. He's a scientist in a mysterious <clears throat> place where humans' memories are being manipulated. Uh, it's a really creative visual film. You had an idea about how that character would speak, right? And when you met with Alex Proyas, you kind of had this sort of sense of you knew kind of new details about this guy that you thought you would, would try out on him and, and to try and get the role, right? Well, it was, <clears throat> I really needed the job. Um, Alex Proyas had written Dark City as a cartoon, uh, not a cartoon, sorry, a comic book, when he was 15 years old. Um, I knew he was going to do a fantastic job with it. I thought the script was incredible. Um, and again, I, I needed the job. And, and the character was uniquely vulnerable and oppressed, uh, very, very smart. Uh, and it, it was the beginning of kind of really wanting to use physicality mm -hmm. uh, to kind of define all of the post and pre damage that had happened to this character leading up to this very moment. And so the, 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 the stutter and the, the dialogue and all of that and then just the hands and all of these pieces kind of making this kind of broken, like literally visually broken person. Um, and. And there was no way that I could articulate that in the meeting that we were having in the Lowe's Hotel in Hollywood. So, I honestly, I've never asked him, but I might have gotten hired just to make me stop. But I started doing the scene in the bar, and I started playing the character to him as if he was the other character. And there was this monologue that I had, and, I, and he, his hand just froze in the nuts, and he's like, <laughs> Like this, and uh, but I didn't, I didn't quit, and um, and he hired me, and it was one of the great again William Hurt, Rufus Sewell, uh, Richard O'Brien. I mean, just fantastic cast, um, and just absolutely loved making the movie. Uh, and I'll tell you, so we were talking earlier about kind of where I hit a limit as a director, and just went, I'm not going to let, you know. I'm not going to put myself in that kind of position again where commerce yeah. is allowed to do that. And I'll tell you why Alex Proyas is right as a director. So he kept saying he needed another $4.5 million to finish the film. And we weren't a big film anyways. We were like at about 22. So this was relatively reasonable back in the day. <clears throat> and, um, and they kept saying no. And he... He kept saying, okay, and then two weeks later he phoned them back and said, I'm really serious, I need $4.5 million to finish this film. And they were like, no. And he said, okay. Anyways, we finished the film. He edits the movie for about six months, special effects and all, scores it, everything, and takes it to New Line, and they screen it. And coming up to the ending and... The, you couldn't have gotten eight executives more engrossed in a movie in your life. I mean, they were just hook, line, and sinker, apparently. And then the movie just stopped. And they start yelling at the projectionist, and they start yelling at this person to get it started and everything else. And he said, it's not his fault, it's done. And they said, what, it's got no ending? He said, I told you I need $4.5 million to finish this fucking movie. So... They gave him the $4.5 million, plus another couple hundred thousand dollars to fly us all back to Australia, and we finished the movie. So I guess unless you have that kind of courage, you should not be looking at the director's box. Right. <laughs> Well, if, this were, if we were on screen right now, Kiefer, and this would kind of be a split screen, there'd now be a box getting larger from the lower right that contains the logo for one of the preeminent shows of the 21st century, uh, the multiple Emmy-winning phenomenon, 24. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What were your thoughts when you, when you heard the pitch, first read the script, and you kind of began working on the project in, in 2000 and, and early 2001? What were your thoughts on it originally and on Jack Bauer? You know, it, it was, first of all, it was an incredibly groundbreaking idea. It was, uh, uh, I remember first reading the script and it says all events take place in real time. I was like, whatever the fuck that means, okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I started reading it and, and it really didn't kind of make sense to me until we actually were shooting it. Uh, Stephen Hopkins, who is the director, is a dear friend of mine. 
he was the one who was really advocating for me to do it. Uh, I had asked him why he was going to do it. And um, he had said, well, I, I've got a daughter who just got accepted to Oxford, so I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I can live with that. I'll do it for the same reason. Yeah. And, and so I did. And then the first kind of great shot that he set up was the opening of the show, which is me on the phone in a car. And I, I pull it in the parking spot. The camera gets out, all handheld. Picks me up getting out of the thing. I walk all the way to the opening of CTU. I take my phone, my gun, my badge. I put it in the thing. Obviously, phone call still going. I pick up my gun. I pick up my badge. I'm talking to my office and I'm going to have to call you back. Da -da -da. Shake Tony Almeida's hand. Introduce that character. Shake Nina Meyer's hand. Introduce that character. Get back on my phone. Start walking upstairs. Finish my conversation with my wife. And then Xander walks in. Mm -hmm. And we finish the scene like that. I think it's like five pages. Yeah. All walk and talk. Wow. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> I thought you just wanted to get your daughter to Oxford. He said, don't worry, you're going to try too. <laughs> <laughs> and we sat with Joel Cernel uh, and kind of worked out what we thought were the principal problems with that pilot at lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and I fell in love with making that character over the course of the pilot. And I really liked, I liked the kind of obvious simplicity of this character that was going to make living for him so complicated. Yeah. And that duality, I was like, oh, this, is, this could be amazing. And then, then it got picked up. And uh, by the time we hit our stride by episodes like three or four, we were having the time of our lives. Yeah. Uh, the whole real... Uh, the whole real-time aspect of the show started to take shape and it became kind of crystal clear how we were going to make things work. Um, the writing was exciting. Um, and we realized that if we just kept moving at 100 miles an hour, mm -hmm. that it would work. Yeah. And you move at 100 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, until you stop. Yeah. And so you go from, you know, it's like that great ad. I don't need a car that goes from right, right. zero to 60 in three seconds. I need a car that goes from 100 to 55 right. in two. Right. Yeah. And so as a show, if you can kind of keep it just blistering pace, yeah. every time you slam on the brakes, yeah. you're going to make a point with it. And so it became this kind of fantastic device. Uh, and I think we just, we had one of the best crews. We did eight seasons in the United States, 96% uh, of our crew. Uh, was with us from the first day to the last. Um, and that was because, sadly, a few people passed. Um, and, and it, yeah, it was just, uh, we were also making, you know, anywhere from four to two episodes a year more than everybody else. Um, and we had Kassar, John Kassar as a director and his family kind of took care of the crew. And we, we would have work all week and then we'd have Friday night together at a barbecue at his house. I mean, we lived like that. And, and I've got a picture of my daughter when I started the show. She was about 11 years old and I've got a picture of her graduating at NYU when we finished. You know, uh, thank you, writer Strike. Um, not this last one, the, the one way before. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it, was the great, it was the great education for me. Um, Again, very young when I had thought this, and I think all the other younger actors thought it as well, but the kind of, the really s kind of cool career to have was Robert De Niro's in 1979, 1980. And he was doing maybe one film every three years, and so every young actor was like, that's what you got to do. And if you want to make the Olympics, you train every day. If you want to run and marathons, you train every day. And boy, had I gotten that wrong. And so when I started 24 and I started to be able to work every day, and I'm working with these incredible actors, and we had a revolving door of actors that were coming through that were just so good, from small parts to larger parts to, you know, just really, uh, our casting people were extraordinary, our stunt people were extraordinary, and just the amount of stuff that you just start processing and learning and just putting it into a bag. Uh, Every, everything else, you know, I think my career up until that point, I've had moments where I've been offensive uh, on the offense as an actor, and there's moments where I've been defensive as an actor, kind of, oh, I don't know how to handle this moment. 
I've never felt that way after 24. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm right, but I have never felt that I didn't know how to attack a moment for myself. Yeah. And, uh, and 24 gave that to me and uh, ended up being kind of one of the most exciting decades I've had, even though it was playing the same character. This character was slightly different every season. And mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden you get to focus on kind of minutia in a way that no other project has allowed me to think about or do. And so it was, yeah, it was the great, it was the great educator for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The character evolves so beautifully. And there's just a, a line that I read in one of the interviews where I saw it, where uh, there's a, a handheld camera operator, I guess, named Guy. Guy, yeah. Right. And and when you guys ended, I think your eighth season or your ninth season, like you kind of looked at each other and were like, we danced together because that sort of that is exactly what it is, right? It was the handheld. We did a thing in season one, I think episode two or three. I'm, I'm turning, starting to initiate a turn to kind of figure out where I am. And I know I'm going to do a 360, and he knows he's going to do a 362, and he starts to go with me. And I thought, well, we could double the speed with this. And so without warning him, I just changed direction. And he kept going the other way. And so we just started picking up speed. And he stopped, and he went, that's great. That's great. Let's do that again. This time I know. And so we started perfecting these kinds of moves together and that you would only get from a Steadicam camera. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he was just a badass. I mean, it messed up his back badly over the course of a decade, and, and he's paid a price for it. Um, he's also someone I remember, I was doing a sequence with him. Uh, he's coming towards me, I'm, and we're on planks. We're on planks this wide, and we're up, and I've got to jump into the back of a cement truck or a garbage truck or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm running through the scaffolding. Well, he's blind. He's, he, all he sees is this frame. He can't see anything else. And he hits a piece of scaffolding, and he's moving at a pretty good clip. And I could see the blood just go straight up in the air. He didn't slow down a lick. And I'm like, well, I'm not slowing down to tell him what he's just done to his head. So off I went into the back of that truck, and he stayed with me the whole time, pulled the camera off, sent him to the hospital. He got 22 stitches, came right back. So it was, it was. But we fed off of it. Yeah. Uh, I've got, I, I got a whole part of this pinky that's in the back window of a, of a, of a Toyota Celica or something wow. that you know, uh, blew the blew the back of the window out, then went in a little too far, yeah. and just like literally, half wow. of that's gone. Uh, but it, it was everybody was willing to give a little, and it was a really physical show, yeah. and it was kind of those kinds of, that kind of commitment that we had from everybody to do it. And it, it wasn't something that you want, you didn't try to hurt yourself, but if something happened, yeah. you were kind of proud that you were putting out as much as everybody else. Yeah. And yeah, I couldn't speak enough to all those people. And I'm not, uh, I'm not necessarily always overtly emotional. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd really prepared for saying, having that last moment on 24 and you know thanking everybody for what they've done and I, I thought about it a lot obviously um, but when I shook his hand and I just went to say it's been an honor you know and couldn't get it out <laughs> and he I was like <laughs> he went me too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk to our, our other corners like that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But we still see each other to, to this okay. day, which is kind of, that's a rare thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. Uh, I still see, I probably see John Kassar later tonight. And yeah. I see those guys out in California when I get there. And yeah, and so um, it's still a close group. Yeah. After the, the physical intensity and, and intensity on, on all levels for 24, um, you did a couple of emotional, uh, kind of emotional intense uh, performances. One in, on Broadway, your first Broadway performance in, in that championship season, and also in Melancholia, Lars von Trier's drama. Yeah. I'm wondering about, uh, Kiefer, when you have a performance like that, is there a way to almost channel out your actual life when you're dealing with a character, a film, a play that's that's that intense or that requires so much of you. Is there sort of a, a, a tool or a technique that you have, I'm sure an actor would, would want to know, is there to kind of filter out some of that other stuff? I think you look, you look forward to it, right? I think you have to look forward to kind of the expulsion. Uh, we have, all, all acting is to me is the manipulation of certain emotions and moments to kind of create a moment 
to help tell a story within the confines of what a character is supposed to be by definition of its writing. And so in Melancholia is kind of a, a pretty restrained kind of piece in a very kind of dark film. Um, but my character really is representative of the character that goes, it's going to be fine, it's going to be, holy shit, boom, and you're dead, right? So he wasn't the great thinker of that piece. Um, having said that, you have to kind of fit into everything else. Um, when I think of Jack Bauer at the end of season two, and he's managed to save this, this, and that, and then just has a complete emotional breakdown in the pickup truck at the end of the thing, because he, it, it was just too much for him. Uh, those are great moments when you think, I'm gonna do this. Mm -hmm. hadn't, it wasn't scripted, it hadn't told anybody. Uh, but John is gonna like me at the barbecue tonight. <laughs> and then, then you go through this fear of, can I hit it the way I wanna hit it? Mm -hmm. And then if you do, and I did in that case, hit it the way I wanted to hit it. Oh, the relief. The relief, not only as an actor, just to be able to have that moment, but to be able to let it go, right? I, I often wish that there were moments where, you know, as much as I don't know how to meditate, I wish I could go to a room sometimes and just cry and just let it out because you feel so much better after, right? Um, and we're, we're just kind of trained not to. Um, and I wish I could do that without, without kind of a sen any sense of purpose, right? Yeah. Um, but so in, in those moments that, that you have as an actor kind of facing you, uh, whether they're extreme anger, extreme fear, extreme pain, anything that's kind of big, to be able to let that out. One of the things that I loved about Jack Bauer was the volume of his voice. Yeah. Uh, we're, we were shooting a trailer and, and I came flying around the corner and this was not a crew that I was working with, this was here in New York. This was actually one of my favorite stories. And, and I came around that corner and I was like, don't move! And the entire street just <laughs> fucking froze except for this Chinese lady who had all these groceries and she wasn't stopping for anything. Um, and, and, but yeah. And it, there was just something about yeah. kind of the volume and the excitement. It, to anyone who's on the other end of this microphone, I am so sorry that I did that to your ears. <laughs> uh, but it, there was something so exhilarating about just letting that out. And so, again, I, I don't mean to make it cathartic, but just take some enjoyment where you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Since you uh, mentioned vocal stuff, uh, I'm sure a lot of actors here would want to know because uh, you are a phenomenal vocal uh, actor in so many ways. And Phone Booth, you reunited with Joel Schumacher where you, except for one brief little moment that I'm not going to case anybody hasn't seen, I don't want to ruin anything, you are uh, a malevolent voice on the phone uh, threatening Colin Farrell. Uh, you narrated 12 for him, the adaptation of uh, Nick McDonald's novel. And uh, Monsters vs. Aliens, there's lots of different uh, <coughs> opportunities for that. I'm, I'm curious about what makes a great vocal performance, Kiefer, in some ways? Well, I think something that engages the audience. I, I always find it so funny when I, because I don't necessarily know the actors that are playing certain parts, um, but, um, you know, when I actually see, you know, whether, you know, Ellen's character in Finding Nemo, you know, it's like, oh my God, that, that's her voice. And, and then I think it's a big plus that I didn't right out of the gate know that it was her voice mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, that she's telling the story. Uh, so the anxiety and the speed with which she talks, she does all of those physical mannerisms, but she's not actually restricted by her own physicality, yeah. which is such a, you know, Albert Brooks. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know until I saw the documentary that he, yeah. that Rob yeah, Reiner yeah, yeah. just made on him, that, that he was actually Nemo's father. Yeah. Um, and how much that messed with his kids yeah. when they <laughs> went and saw it. Um, <laughs> But it was, uh, you know, so I, it's, it's, it's all of the same stuff. It's how do you create a voice that, that defines the character as written mm -hmm. that's going to engage an audience person into to, to watching it? I mean, in Monsters vs. Aliens, I kind of cheated because I wanted to do something that was kind of very broad because yeah. the movie was really broad. And I kind of stole a little... Not a little, I stole a lot of Yosemite Sam. Oh. And so, yeah. you know, 
for monsters versus aliens being, monsters? We can't have monsters in the army. <laughs> You send me Sam. Yeah, right. Bring on a rabbit. I hate rabbits. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and pretty similar. And uh, but no one got on me about it, so they let me go with it. <clears throat> I also hear a little bit of uh, George C. Scott in uh, in Doctor Strange Love in there too, a little bit. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, these are all. It's all storytelling, of course. Uh, and another aspect of storytelling for you is music. Uh, it's an art form important to you. In 2016, years after having your own record label, Ironworks, you released your first album. Uh, these are filled with personal songs, not always, but most of them. They come from within you and are influenced by the musical artists that you love, Kiefer. You performed at the Grand Ole Opry. Um, this is, of course, and yes. Thank you. Another masterful way. You've kind of said that it's almost like keeping a journal for you, songwriting in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, does music inform your acting and vice versa? And what's the storytelling uh, beauty of, of music for you? Well, it, was, it was interesting. I, I had thought, given 30, 40 years of working as a professional actor, either on stage or off stage or in film, um, that when going to play live music shows, that, that I would be able to take from that, uh, take some kind of comfort. And, and, and I, was, I was really wrong. I had it inverted. Uh, and the missing component, what I hadn't thought about, was that as an actor, I'm telling someone else's story. As an actor, uh, I didn't write any of the films or television shows that I've made. I didn't design or create those characters. Those characters aren't me. But as a songwriter, the song is definitely me. Um, you know, when, when I wrote uh, with, with Jude Cole that first record, songs like Not Enough Whiskey, um, that's, that's a perspective that's mine. When I wrote a song like Saskatchewan, which was about the death of my mother, that song is mine. And so there is no character to hide behind in that circumstance. And so what that requires is being able to say, look, I was in this, I was going through this thing and, and, uh, and it was hard. And I ended up writing this song about kind of being left alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, at a time when I really didn't want to be left alone. Yeah. And this is a song called Calling Out Your Name, and if you listen to the lyrics, you might find that you've been in this similar place, and, mm -hmm. and I hope this makes you feel better, you know, and you can play that song. And so it requires that kind of engagement. So after, we were doing over 100 shows a year, so after about five or six years, I started to feel really confident for the first time within myself, as, and, and I'm going to actually say as a performer, I'm, the, the person is still a work in progress, but I started to feel confident about myself uh, as a performer. And, uh, and that actually had a profound impact on my acting. Mm -hmm. And so I felt comfortable playing characters that I thought were a lot closer to me as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would bring me to something like Designated Survivor. Mm -hmm. um, which, oh, thank you, darling. Thanks. Um, and, yeah, just, uh, you know, I felt that Tom Kirkman was a really compassionate person. Uh, he was someone who was going to do the best he can, could, not necessarily thinking he was maybe the best person for the job. He was a very human character. Uh, and I felt very confident about being able to in, in, not having to frame up a character, but actually allowing myself to kind of occupy that space in a way that, A, I wouldn't have been felt confident, certainly before something like 24, and B, uh, not needing to kind of overdress it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just let it be. Yeah. Well, it was a, a perfect leading to designated survivor. Uh, you answered my question uh, because obviously Tom Kirkman is such a uh, an interesting character. He's the kind of president I think a lot of people would like to have in office, and and uh, and there's a gentleness to him and a, a cerebral quality to him. He's a terrific character, and I'm wondering what you, what your thoughts were when you first read uh, Designated Survivor's uh, Ab script. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. I mean, absolutely loved it. I think we made some critical mistakes. Um, in, in kind of personnel that uh, David Guggenheim, who wrote it, uh, you know, had not written a television series before, and some de decisions were made that limited his kind of power on the show, if you will, uh, and his talent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was part of those mistakes as well. 
Um, and so it's just, and, and it was one of those situations where I just think there were too many cooks in the kitchen. And, and I, I know that the initial impetus to, to have that many cooks was as a support system. But unfortunately, it never stays a support system. It becomes uh, an opinion disaster. And uh, um, so I think the show kind of, on a production level, maybe suffered a bit from that. Uh, but that first season, David David really wrote that, and and he managed to kind of suffer through it all and navigate through it, and I think did a beautiful job. Uh, I love the character, I love the cast, I love making that show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm proud of its success, um, but it was a, it was a big thing for me on a personal level to kind of play a character that was just kind of almost neutral, mm -hmm. if you would, mm -hmm. and still allow that character to be compassionate mm -hmm. and relatable, mm -hmm. um, but not having to go to extremes like I did with the dialogue volume of Jack Bauer, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that this could be much yeah. more restrained and pulled back. And so, yeah, it was a fantastic time for me. Yeah. Just mentioning the uh, notion of a personal level, what was it like working with your dad uh, in Forsaken, which John Cusser also directed? Uh, for those of us who had always been wanting uh, the two of you to share scenes together, Forsaken is a really terrific Western, and both of you are fantastic in it. What conversations did the two of you have preparing for it? Well, we never had any conversation preparing for it. Um, I'm going to say this with, with kind of the lightest heart possible. I did, I did the glass menagerie at the Royal Alex with my mother mm -hmm. for seven months and then the National Arts Center for another four. And then I did this film with my dad. Mm -hmm. And uh, during both circumstances, I found myself uh, uh, wandering off into the woods going, why had I think this was a good idea? <laughs> uh, because I saw it today. Uh, I, I did uh, the CBS morning show this morning, and they, they had quotes uh, for why people think Christmas is so stressful. And almost 82% of people said it's because they're going home. And out of that 82%, 90-something percent of those people said, because my parents still treat me like a child. I'm 57 years old. You can't tell me where I'm going for lunch. You can't make me sit down. Um, and, and yet, both of them have proved me wrong. <laughs> my mother actually grabbed me by my ear. <laughs> I was shocked. Right. I said, I'll do anything, just let go of my ear. <laughs> and she did. And so that's kind of on the lighter side of things. The, the real truth is that I loved working with my dad. And, and I think he's one of the most extraordinary actors in the English language. And... And he's the only actor that I can tell you that I've worked with to this date that caught me out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the early scenes. It was about the death of my mother and my absence from the home when she died and when she was calling out for me. And he had a scene that he did so beautifully and it was just kind of the, the releasing of rage just building and building and building, and the volume just slowly going and going and going, and, and really building to this apex. And I made the terrible mistake of, I went from being right there in the scene to, huh, that's a good choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I started watching, I was, took myself right out of the scene and I started watching him as if I were watching a film. And then it just went quiet, and I went, uh-oh. <laughs> that was my turn. And I, I, I was watching him, but I stopped listening as I should have been. And it's the only time it's actually ever happened to me. And he knew it, too. And he smiled and he went, pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I said, not bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that brings us up to the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. It is so engaging. It is beautifully nuanced. It's on Showtime. It was directed by the great William Friedkin, who also adapted it from the 1953 play. Yes, That's his new name, the great William Friedkin. No, that is the great William Friedkin, exactly. He sadly passed away just two months before the, the mm -hmm. film premiered this fall. Um, your portrayal of, of, of fictional naval officer Captain Quig is terrific. He's Thank you. blusterous and 
paranoid but also serious and sympathetic. Um, he's been called one of the best acting turns of your career. Uh, and talk to us about how you, how you approach the role. I mean, there's almost a, an aspect of PTSD in Quig. It's a, it's a really nuanced and layered performance. How did you approach it? Well, I think the, the first thing is you start breaking down the text. And, and we had two weeks to shoot the entire film. Uh, and so I learned it like a play with a dear friend of mine, Beth Elliott, who gave up her whole Christmas holiday to learn it with me. And, um, and you know, in the context of getting prepared for a play, you'd have four weeks rehearsal at a minimum, then you'd have two weeks dress rehearsals, getting into your theater, uh, and, and then you would normally do at least depending on what job you're coming from, you would normally be, have done at least a couple weeks' work before. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you'd be looking at eight to nine weeks to really get a play under your belt. Um, Quig has the command of the dialogue from Act 1 to Act 2. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that two weeks was going to be a lot to get this kind of under our belt. So we did it kind of 10, 12 hours a day. Um, and in that context, Yes, you're trying to kind of get lines, and especially because as much as they say they updated the text, they didn't. You know, putting in the Hermus Strait and putting in, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq doesn't change the text. The truth is the text is still from the film, uh, and it's got a very 50s kind of flavor to it, which is not dialogue we use to this day, and yet... <laughs> not going to take the chance of working with Mr. Freakin to find out that he wants it word perfect. So we're going to make it word perfect to this kind of odd kind of rhythm yeah. that the dialogue had. And then I started to kind of be able to really pay attention to the text in a way that you wouldn't just reading. Yeah. If you're going over it and over and over it 10 hours a day. And I realized that this is a play in two parts. The first part is this guy who's actually challenging the Navy and who he thinks are these mutinous soldiers. And the second act is solely a guy who's now challenging himself, mm -hmm. who's realizing that the person he wanted to be is not the person who he is. And we only really kind of discover, and me, I personally kind of believe we only really discover that maybe we're not who we thought we were and we're not the best version of ourselves, but we're something in between when we start to feel that we're less relevant and being thrown aside, which is exactly what's happening to this guy. And I think all of us at some point in our lives will go through that moment where we have to chart the difference between the person we wanted to be and who we really are. And I think that's a really painful part of life for any person around. And depending on the, the space between who you wanted to be and who you are uh, is, is kind of the measure of how devastating that can be. In this circumstance, it's the worst because it's public and it's in front of the very people that he wanted to like him. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a more painful, hurtful, horrible situation for somebody. And so I think why it works in the context of the material, why uh, Jason Clark's character is still so furious that we've humiliated this man like this, even if he's an asshole, yeah. he didn't deserve this. Uh, that's the humanity of the play. And there were so many opportunities for physicality. Um, we, did, we did the sequence in the whole second act in one take. Um, and I remember, and it's, it, it was a 24 minute take, 25 minutes. And I remember thinking to myself, on the way out because there's always just this inherent thought you know get out get out get off stage go go and, and I remember having a whole fight with myself because my back's to camera and I'm like you speed up I'll fucking kill you and I'm like slower slower like this this man had just been broken up there and the parts weren't working anymore and uh, yeah it was one of the greatest feelings in the world when I came back because Mr. Freakin will let you know when he's happy, but he will really let you know if he's not. And, 
and the fact that this man who I've idolized as a filmmaker uh, was happy uh, made my year. Yeah, yeah, so it was great. And, and just a note about him. When, I, when Jason Clark finally said, no, go tell him you need a second take. Mm -hmm. By the time I mustered the courage to go do that, I walked to the video village in the back and he was already editing the take into the film. I was like, <laughs> fuck, I don't think he's gonna give me a second take, but he did. <laughs> he was very generous and he gave me a second take and then uh, I, I'm almost positive he didn't use any of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he was, he was, he was amazing and just, like someone had asked me what it was like to work with him. And it, technical skill is, is a thing, right? You, you learn technical skill. And, and, and not everybody can even learn that, but, but you can learn technical skill. You can learn why you put this camera on a 35 millimeter and you have it static and why you put the 50 on a dolly. How are you gonna cross reference the two of them when they pass each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can learn all of these things. But boy, when you see talent, it smacks you in the mouth. It's just like, holy shit. He, he set up seven cameras on that take, two of them dollies, one of them handheld moving, not one of them interrupted the other. The lens choices were extraordinary. He choreographed a ballet. And with a, he choreographed a ballet with an actor stuck in a chair that's not gonna move for 25 minutes, yeah. and then he shot it. Yeah. And it was just like, yeah, and he, and, and he inspired you and, and then made you feel great if you did it right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love your description of, of everything that Queeg goes through and, and what, his, uh, what his heart was feeling uh, during those scenes. But I also want to touch base on the, on the aspect of being stuck in a chair, which I think is fascinating. Queeg is only seen on the witness stand, uh, which is its own challenge, I'm sure. Uh, he's a witness for the prosecution, then he's a witness for the defense. It must be so important to study each beat Kiefer, each silence, each glance, for the performance to be to be what you want it to be. Because you know, when you're stuck there, you kind of you know you're lacking half of your physicality. It's all sort of every little soft, quiet moment, right? Well, you are and you aren't. I mean, there's kinds of there's so many things you can do. Uh, I angled my right foot mm. as hard a 90 degree to the left as I could, so to the point where it was almost painful, and and just that parts were just not right, they weren't, and this is all different from when he sat down at the first testimony. By the time he gets to the second testimony, he's already broken, and you can see the physical signs of it. And so the restraint of the chair actually is a huge asset oh, okay. in that point. Um, acting is a team sport, mm -hmm. uh, and there was Lance Reddick mm -hmm. on the jury, said two lines in the whole 25 minutes, mm -hmm. never, backed off a beat, eyes staring at you, unless he chose not to stare at you, and that was a moment in itself too. Uh, Jason Clark, that was my dance partner, yeah. you know, and he was extraordinary, and, and he had all of the physicality, and everywhere he moved, the cameras moved with him, so he couldn't screw that up either. Yeah. So it's, it's, those are the people that help define those moments too, and you're on the fly, but I trusted Lance so much, implicitly, uh, and I trusted Jason too, that those moments became very kind of organic uh, and, and not thought out. Thank God, as a contrast to all of the things that are thought out. And so they live together. So it's, it's just, again, you had a director. And this was an interesting thing too, because this, this is different filmmaking. The filmmaking in the 70s, the, it was absolute dictatorship. You know, filmmakers were the dictators. Uh, the whole television business is structured the way it is that writers are showrunners and they're in charge. Is payback for the directors that they wrote for <laughs> yeah. as, as film writers because they were kicked off of every set that they could have. Sherry Lansing, the president of Paramount, married to William Freakin, was never allowed on his set. I mean, it's hysterical to me. Um, but on some level, it works because we all worked for this one man mm -hmm. and we all wanted to please this one man because we had such faith and belief in what he was gonna do. And none of us were let down by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Now the film is terrific. I'm gonna get to a couple of uh, audience questions uh, very quickly. We don't have that much time, so I would like to get to all of them, but I'll just start with a few. Um, 
have you made music for any of any films that you've been in, or would you like to make any music that would be in one of your films? Ask one of the questions from Chris. Um, I, I have not, and 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 I, I I wouldn't use it in any of my films if someone else felt the song would work in theirs. Uh, I would do it. I, I just there's too many other musicians that I know that would make musical kind of decisions. One of Rocco De Luca who just did the Martin Scorsese film and he did it on a pedal steel and lap steel guitar. Like I, I, for my kind of film I would opt for something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, that would just be a step I wouldn't be comfortable taking. Yeah, yeah. Next question is, uh, how do you derive the techniques that you have that work for you in terms of developing characters and how has it changed, if it has changed, over your career? It's constantly evolving. It's, uh, I don't know who's asked the question, but it's a great question uh, and it's constantly evolving. Um, everything I learned from the Bay Boy went straight into the film that I did uh, with Mr. Spielberg uh, and everything that I learned from those two projects went straight into Stand By Me and so on and so on and so on. Um, uh, and, and when I say everything I learned, it's not necessarily because I did something that worked. A lot of the learning comes from something you do that doesn't work. And a lot of the learning comes from something you do that's maybe almost even, in, well, not almost or even, embarrassing. And, and, uh, and that's, that's really important, too. I was, I was doing a scene in a film with Bobby Carlyle. <laughs> and and, and, and we, it, it was the, uh, the Bataan Death March, and we were all uh, Allied Forces POWs in a Japanese concentration camp. And we were trying to save one of our soldiers, and they were kind of working on that soldier, and, and the camera kept rolling, and, and no one was calling cut, and, da, da, da. and finally I just leaped up on top of the, the soldier and just started doing compressions like that. And Bobby Carlisle started laughing, <laughs> like I'd watched too many episodes of ER or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he started laughing at me, and Bobby's one of my favorite actors and one of my best friends and then the other and the other actors were all British and they and it was just a different sense of style right a different sense of kind of uh, but I went for it and uh, I was humiliated for days um, <laughs> and I was embarrassed for years um, but the truth is I'd probably do the same thing again because you don't know what kind of moment might come out of those things um, so but it, it's 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 constantly evolving um, again, I've been so lucky to work with so many great actors that uh, the trust that kind of is built between actors and, in, in, you know, I think if, if, if Bobby and I weren't such good friends at that time, he would never have left, right? I mean, we were just kind of making fun of each other, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's constantly figuring out physicality is such an important aspect for me uh, of a performance. Um, and I'm very aware of kind of now subtle ways to accomplish kind of evoking a response uh, than, I, than I was 20 years ago, and even 10. Yeah. And here's a question from the audience that serves as a great wrap-up question, which is, what is the best advice you've ever received regarding your acting career, best acting advice you've ever received? Um, well, the best acting advice I'd ever received actually was from my dad. And, and, and it's funny to actually say that because we, we talk so little uh, about it and have talked so little about it. But he said, never let them catch you lying. Mm. Um, if it says in the script, you know, and at the culmination of the scene, he breaks down and cries. And this scene hasn't gotten you to that place. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. Don't fake it because they will catch you. And of course, I was young and I faked it and I got caught, you know, in a couple things trying to kind of work it. So, so I learned my lesson. My, my best advice, though, is don't quit. Mm. Um, I've, I've worked with a number of actors. Lance Reddick is a perfect example. I just thought he was an actor who hadn't been realized and recognized until, you know, uh, The Wire. Yeah. Uh, but that's really basically when he started his career. Yeah. He just did other stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Alan Ruck, when we went and did Young Guns 2, Alan Ruck 
couldn't get a job after Ferris Bueller because of typecasting and because no one had the vision. And he ended up taking a job at a Home Depot warehouse because at least there he could work in the back because everybody still recognized him as this iconic character. And when he went to do Young Guns 2, it was kind of a second shot. And he didn't quit, right? And so my advice to any actor is you don't, look, this is hard. This is the hardest part is not knowing when your next job is. Mm -hmm. This is the hardest part is figuring out how to get that next job. And for some of us, it, you're fortunate, and some of us, it's harder. Um, but just don't quit. It doesn't mean you can't do four or five other things. Just don't quit. Yeah. 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 I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. The Kane Mutiny Court Martial is on Showtime, and like all of the Kiefer Sutherland performances we've discussed here and others, it really stays with you. Uh, it's a powerful turn. It's the latest one for you, Kiefer. Thank you for an illuminating entertainment discussion of your work Thank and the art so of storytelling much. and acting. Thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, Kiefer Sutherland. Right. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you guys very much.